My name is Steve Cunningham. If I didn't meet you last night, I'm the Director of Research and Education here. And you, you, have, you have a problem you don't know about yet, and that is that I'm going to talk about something that's probably intrinsically boring. <laughs> See, I don't know because that's the other part of the problem. I actually like this stuff. So I, I'll try to contain myself uh, a little bit with my enthusiasm, but uh, I hope that I can make this useful to you. I, I, we're going to talk about in inflation, including everyday inflation. Uh, Julie and I put this together. I, I had thought initially my first reaction as an economist was put up lots of numbers and, and dazzle them with, with that, you know. And, but then I realized that's probably not as useful as backing up a little bit and talking about what this, this whole subject is about and what the intrinsic problems are. I, I, I'm, I'm not a reporter and I, I don't pretend to understand your, your world, you know, uh, so I'm if I, if I get off track, you, you feel free to ask me questions. But um, I would imagine that one of the things that is important is to understand what these actual what these measures actually do. What are we trying to measure? What are we trying to achieve? How do these measures fail? How do they succeed? And so on. So you can better interpret the results. Um, there we go. This is a chart that I I threw up at the last minute. This shows this is a long-term inflation uh, chart annual inflation rates, CPI, Consumer Price Index, that you've heard released many times. And this goes back to 1914. It's a long-term chart. Now, the first things that jump out is you, 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 you tend to jump right into this and say, look at the high volatility in prices back there prior to 1962. That was the, the purpose of the chart, actually, was to show you that. And to also show that there is an inflationary bias uh, after 1962, and the prices tend to, to run above zero. So there's a long-term inflationary bias. The problem with this is, is that it begs the whole question of what in the heck is this graph of anyway? I'm saying prices like it really is about prices. Is it about prices? Is that what I'm really measuring here? And this is one of the problems we have in economics. We have an economic concept, and then we'd like to measure it, and the measurement falls short in many ways. And so as an economist, what I'm always doing is asking that question Often when I show this to the public, they say the things that I just said. Oh, prices were more volatile before, maybe some inflation bias. Now, they don't ask the most important question, what the heck is this graph of? What does it measure? And therefore, what does it actually mean? And, and, and that's, that's where we can, we in the, the Institute can be of some service to people, I think. So let's talk about inflation measures. Uh, most commonly, people use price indexes, and I'm going to use that term loosely for a moment, that are constructed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, this is the CPI. You know the CPI. There's specifically there's a CPIU, CPIW, uh, CPIR, CPIE, a CCPI. A lot of people don't realize that there are all these other ones, and, and, and how do they differ, and why would they even bother? Now, I want to I point out that these folks at BLS do a remarkable job have a lot of integrity, they're excellent economists, they're trying to do something very important that's maybe intrinsically, I was going to say difficult, maybe intrinsically impossible to get an accurate reading on prices around the economy. Uh, so this is not to challenge their work, but to better understand what they're doing. Where the problems mostly arise is in people misusing their data, you know, misinterpreting it in some way. And we have some things that we've done that we hope provide some interesting information on prices and how it affects Americans. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So normally we take one of these CPIs, we look at the percentage change in the index, and we treat that as the inflation rate. So the way that the CPI is constructed is basically it's a shopping list. They've surveyed people. They say, what do you buy? What goods do you buy? How much of them do you buy? Where do you buy them? Okay. then they really put together this list. Uh, they, they look to see what people buy in a given month. And then they construct an index. They literally go out and shop the, the list and see what it costs to buy this. Now, I used to see this uh, in the newspapers around where uh, a leading newspaper would go to uh, different parts of the state in which they, they, they operate and they would have a shopping list and go to grocery stores in different parts of the state and see how the, the bill for these, these groceries differed and they would talk about that. Or they would go to different gas stations and see how gasoline prices varied. This is simply month to month rather than place to place. They do actually do place to place too. 
Now, there we go. So to compute their indexes, they, the undertaking is massive. It's impressive. Uh, they survey families representing about 87% of the total U.S. population in a, in a sweeping study over a two-year period. They collect information from approximately 28,000 weekly diaries and 60,000 quarterly interviews uh, to get these, these weights, these shopping lists. You know, what are you buying? Uh, how, how much of each thing are you buying? And so on. And then using uh, scientific procedures in each category, they, uh, they choose samples of several, several hundred specific items uh, within selected business establishments frequented by consumers. So they're capturing where they buy it. And we know that when prices change, people will substitute goods. The, 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 the original Tea Party was uh, an example of that. You know, the, the, um, the taxes on tea were too high, so people switched to, to, to uh, coffee, you know. Uh, they also change where they buy. So I used to go to Sears, now I'm going to go to Walmart or whatever. They, they change the place they go. So they have to capture all of this. And there's a few twists on this that are kind of curious that we'll get to in a minute. So each month they send out shoppers to literally shop the shopping list. Now I always wondered, you know, in graduate school, why can't I find this? I want this job. <laughs> what a great job. You just go out and shop and you get paid for it. I mean, is this great or what, you know? Uh, so they, they go out and they shop these, these, uh, these shopping lists and uh, they compile prices of about 80,000 items a month to, to build this index. So that's a that is a representative sample. They can use the statistics to then build the, the index values. So in short, they, they shop the, the shopping list, and then they build the index, and then they compute the change from the previous month. So that all sounds pretty good. How could you possibly do better than that? What possible problems could there be? Now let's talk about the specific indexes. There's some curious things here. The CPIU is the one you probably know as the CPI. This is the consumer price index for all urban consumers. And it is what it sounds like. It's urban as opposed to rural. So it leaves out uh, rural uh, consumers. It includes all urban households in MSAs and in urban places of 2,500 inhabitants or more. So it, it does exclude a number of people. It, it, it does include non-farm consumers that live in rural areas within MSAs. It excludes rural consumers and the military and the institutional population. So it's representative of the buying habits of about 80% of the non-institutional population of the U.S. So they're getting about 80% there. So this is the reason why this one is used most widely. It sort of makes sense. What does institutional mean? People in prison? Or prison uh, that, are, that are living in nursing homes or whatever else, you know. Uh, so these are people out freely moving around the, the society, buying, uh, paying for goods and services. Um, it, of course, one of the reasons for excluding uh, people who live uh, in rural areas is that farm workers, uh, they can grow a lot of their own food. Uh, they, they tend to produce a lot of their own goods. And so it, 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 it kind of is distortive if you go in that, that direction. Now the CPIW you may not know as much about. This is the Consumer Price Index for Urban Wage Earners and Clerical Workers. Now it, it includes consumer units like households with clerical workers, sales workers, craft workers, uh, operative uh, service workers or laborers. It excludes professional managerial, technical workers, self-employed, short-term workers, the unemployed, retirees, and so on. And more than half of the consumer unit's income has to be earned in one of these occupations. Uh, it captures the buying habits of about 32% of the non-institutional population. Now, this is obviously a much more restrictive set. It excludes higher income people. It excludes a lot of specialty groups. But this is the index they use to do the cost of living uh, increases for Social Security, not the CPIU. Now you would think CPIU would make a lot more sense. It's more broadly based, captures more of the experience of more Americans. This is very specialized and very limited, but in fact, this is the index they use to make the cost of living adjustments. Yeah? What is the difference uh, in the practice, in numbers, in 
I'll, I'm going to show you in a second. No, that's a fair question. Um, but this is the one they use for those colas, uh, even though it's, it is a little more limited. We're hearing a lot lately about the CCPIU. This is the chain CPI. Uh, it's based on the same methodology as CPIU, but the weights are updated monthly. And so it better captures substitution uh, effects that we were talking about earlier, where people, if the prices go up, they switch to a different good or a different venue. So it captures other changes in consumer behavior. Uh, in the CPIU, the, the uh, weights are only updated in January of the even numbered years and they're held constant for two years, so uh, it does not capture the substitution effects as well. So there's been a lot of talk about switching to this for, for colas. Now, if you were going to have a cost of living uh, increase for people on Social Security, this would look like a pretty good option. This is the actual cost of living for the elderly, and if I understand Social Security right, I think they're mostly elderly. Um, so that might be the cost that they face. And as we can imagine, they, they spend less on things like education and more on things like medicine and things like that. So, so it, it, it captures a different uh, array of goods. Um, now, according to a BLS study from December 1982 through December 2011, all the, the all-item CPIE, so we're not excluding food and energy or something like that, uh, rose at an annual rate of 3.1% compared with increases of 2.9% for both the CPIU and CPIW. So that means that there is a higher cost of living for the elderly, which means they've been losing purchasing power at a rate of about 0.2% uh, percentage points per year. Uh, but of course, if you were to make the cost of living adjustments based on CPIE, uh, it would be more costly to the government because of Social Security. And in fact, uh, in a study by Hoban and Lagakos, um, if the COLAs were based on CPIE, Social Security Trust Fund would run out of money five years earlier, which is probably why we don't use it. It has nothing to do with what's right or what makes sense, it's, it's what we do. Um, also, we have a PCE, which is the Personal Consumption Expenditures Implicit Price uh, Index or deflator. This is much more broad. This is the one the Fed uses uh, because it includes all consumer goods and it, it allows the mix and selection to change automatically. It's whatever they actually bought, not according to a, a shopping list. It's whatever they bought. Uh, it's the price index the Fed officially targets according to their announcement at the Humphrey Hawkins hearing in the Senate Finance Committee you know, in, uh, in the year 2000. It excludes housing because it's only consumer goods. It doesn't, uh, housing is an investment good. So it doesn't appear in consumption expenditure. So uh, it, it, is, it is not as comprehensive in that sense. It doesn't hold uh, housing. The, the PC includes healthcare, whereas the CPI doesn't. That that there, there is a, it's handled, the very limited handling of healthcare in, in the CPI. Yeah, yeah, very limited handling. Because you have issues with, uh, insured behavior and uninsured behavior and out of pocket and there's all sorts of problems with that. You do get um, like uh, medicines and, and drugs that are captured in CPI but the main healthcare part is, is problematic. It also avoids some bundling issues, bundling zero cost issues where, where um, uh, a bank will offer a bundle of services, um, some of which are unpaid but they're covered by other other kinds of of, um, of things that you do, like you let, you let the bank hold your deposit, but they'll give you free checking. So the, they're, you're, you're receiving less interest in order to get free checking, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't show up as a price. You're, paying, you're getting checking, you're not paying an explicit price for it, but as part of the bundling, you are in effect paying for it. So there's all sorts of bundling issues that you would not capture in a, in a CPI. But since 1992, it's risen about a third less than the CPI. So it, it, is, uh, it shows much, much less inflation. So if in fact, this shows the, the three, the CPIU, CPIW, and the PCE. And as you can see, the CPIU and W are very close together. And the one that I marked, this, the PCE, is the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index. 
It's substantially lower. I set these all equal to 100 and 2,000 for convenience. It's substantially lower. And if your job is to, to keep uh, inflation in check, keep prices more stable, then if I had a choice, I'd pick the one that's the easiest, and that would be the PCE. That will be my target because I'll have less trouble hitting that target. You can also see it in growth rates. This shows since 2010, the lowest line is the PCE. And as you can see, it's much less volatile. It's, it, it shows always lower inflation rates, or almost always lower inflation rates than the other indexes. So there's a tendency to want to focus on this one if you are in monetary policy. It also is broad-based. So it does have that, that advantage that it is broad-based and uh, uh, broader-based than the, the CPI. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the CPIW is, in many cases, less than the CPIU. Uh, it's a little less volatile. Uh, these are total indexes. These are not core. These are not stripped of, uh, of uh, food and energy. So there is a natural stacking here. So you can see, again, why the government would want to use CPIW uh, for Social Security colas instead of CPIU, and uh, the Fed would want to use the PCE because it, it serves their purpose best. So, why is the PCE more conservative? It uh, it's it's more broadly based. It doesn't include housing. It uh, it it incorporates better the, the substitution effects, which reduce uh, inflation. Because if you get a higher price goes up for something, you'll you'll replace it with something cheaper, and so your total cost. Uh, Changes. Is that, I mean, do, do they use, there's, it's, it makes their job easier, but is there also the argument that it's more accurate? I mean, because it does, if it's accounting for substitution, the CPI is not. They, they, they try to argue that, that they, they think that uh, because it handles the substitution effects better, it may be a better measure. I think they also like that it's so broadly based. And you'll see there's some other issues that we're going to get to in the CPI, which the Fed is wise to be thinking about what, what it means. Uh, whether it, the implications of these other problems mean that CPI understates or overstates is another problem. But there are some other issues that, that the PCE avoids, at least directly. There was a commission in 1995, Oscan Commission, which uh, examined these indexes. And they argued that the CPI overestimates the cost of living by 0.8 to 1.6 percentage points annually. Uh, of course, the implications of that would be huge for, for COLAs, you know, cost of living uh, adjustments. Also, if we were to say that uh, there's been a lot of argument that real wages have declined over the years, if in fact they're being deflated by CPI and the CPI is overstated, then that means that, that real earnings could have actually increased. So, you know, we, we make a lot of this business of workers aren't receiving good wages because their real wages have been falling. But that, that begs the question of how did you figure out what real means in that context? So if we're not measuring real right, then we're going to get a misleading result on, on uh, real earnings. Um, the commission also argued that new products did not appear in the, in, appear in the indexes fast enough that a lot of new high technology products, uh, flat panel TVs and cell phones and other things weren't hitting the indexes quickly enough and their, their effect wasn't being uh, uh, taken into account enough. Where this is where the PCE, if it gets bought and sold, it's in the index. Nobody had to pick a shopping list. It's whatever got bought and sold. Uh, so the PCE solves that, that problem. Uh, the better deal with the substitutions uh, they, they decided to compute the CPI with a geometric mean instead of a, an arithmetic mean. Uh, they thought that this helped to uh, make adjustments for substitution, but that also lowered the inflation rate by 0.3% rate by per year. Now, if that is an effective way to do that is, is a question that some people argue and research is done on to try to figure out if that makes sense. But it does bring down the CPI lower than it used to be. So in the first chart that I showed you, we saw inflation coming down you know, to a, a lower level. And part of that could be the way that they're computing it now. And it may be uh, an artifact of the, the, the data process. Uh, well, the, uh, can, can you... Uh, do you know right offhand the geometric mean? It's the you take the the product and you uh, di you divide by the uh, 
where you, you, you take the product and you take the root. You take the product, you take the root. Like if you have 10 products and you, you multiply them, you take the, the 10th root or whatever. One of them is harmonic and one of them is uh, geometric and I get the two confused. That's why I'm struggling with it. Yeah, 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 it's a, it's a, there's a trick to it. But it's not, you don't add them up and divide by the number, you, you actually... Uh, there you go. Think about it a minute. So anyway, one of the things they came up with too is, and this is sort of an interesting quirk that people don't think about, is 99% of the data was collected during the work week because these are full-time employees that are going out working for the, for the BLS. And in fact, they found that an increasing number of goods, in fact, the majority of, of consumer goods are being bought on the weekend when people are off work. And also to accommodate that, stores have sales on the weekend. Macy's always has a sale on the weekend. Oh, yeah. and, so, and so to do this right, you need to be doing the, the, the price checking on the weekends, not during the week. I mean, there's all sorts of tricks here that they had to think about in terms of making this thing more realistic. What about online? Do they track prices online? They do. They do some online tracking. Again, it's wherever these people normally would buy the, the goods, and they've had to make adjustments to, to, to move them to online. And of course, online purchases, uh, there's a lot more competition. People are, I mean, I've done it. I've gone into to Kmart and I've used my phone and scanned the barcode and I said, well, I can buy this online for $20 less. I'll just go home and order it, you know. Uh, and so it's, it's putting price pressure on. One of the things that BLS does that is, uh, is one of the, the questionable things um, and reflects the difference in purpose of the the index than what people perceive it to be is the quality adjustments. Formerly, these are called hedonistic quality adjustments. Um, the idea is that, that, um, for example, uh, we all you know have seen computer prices plummet and the power skyrocket, right? I mean that's that's a sort of a, a rule. Um, and if if in fact, let's say that you're buying a laptop computer and the price uh, of the typical model this year uh, is the same as the one last year. But in fact, to make this simple, uh, the one this year uh, is twice as fast. Then what you'd have to say that I'm getting more for my money. I may be paying the same price, but I'm getting more for my money. And what BLS is trying to measure is what you get for what you pay. And so they would adjust that price down. They would discount it by 50% to reflect the fact that, that you're getting more for the money. Okay, uh, the problem with that is, is that when I go in the store, that's the laptop I can buy, and the price is the same, and it didn't go down. Okay, I do get more computing power, but, but I still have to, out of pocket, I have to pay that much money. Now, I mean, you can perfectly well see BLS's point on this. As a purchasing power index, you would want to make an adjustment for what you're getting. I mean, the, the, the new Ford Mustang has more computing power in it than the original space capsules that, that landed on the moon, you know what I mean? So, I mean, it, there's a difference, you know, you want to capture that somehow, but you have an out-of-pocket issue that you have to deal with. They just released uh, their statements on uh, vehicles, vehicle prices, and uh, they, they estimated that 39.5% of the average increase in manufacturers' invoice prices, wholesale prices, for this year's models over the last year was the result of quality improvements. So they would count that 39% as being, uh, as not being uh, inflation, but rather being quality adjustments. So they're gonna, they're gonna scale this down by almost 40%. At the retail level, they found that 31% of the uh, year-to-year the, uh, -year increase in manufacturer suggested retail prices were quality and they adjusted downward. So these are not small adjustments. That's part of what I'm trying to get across here. These are huge. And I have to pay whatever you know, Ford or Toyota or Nissan or whoever it is is charging. I don't get to say, I'd like the, the quality adjusted price, please. You know? So, so it, it, it represents a divergence between uh, consumer experience and, and the, the, the price index, what it, what it suggests. But if you're trying to measure broad-based um, uh, purchasing power and the effects of policy and other kind of things, you would want to do what BLS does. Unfortunately, it, it pushes it farther and farther from the, the personal experience of people on the street. 
So what does the CPI measure, any of these? It, it is best thought of as a purchasing power price index. Again, it's trying to look at how much you get for what you pay. So it's, it's based on a shopping list. It's a basket of goods uh, that are designed to represent all of the typical expenditures. But also, it is those expenditures without any consideration for how often they occur. I do not buy a refrigerator every day. I just don't do that. Now, there's a little difference in weighting that, it, that deals with that fact, but, but overall, it's still in the index. And in fact, there are a wide array of durable goods that I just do not buy on a regular basis. If you put them in collectively, then the, the weighting is enough to make them significant to the index. But I don't remember the last time I bought a refrigerator. Okay, so there's, a, there's an issue there with what you buy. Also, in the CPI, there's a housing component. But housing is typically handled by a mortgage or by a, a rent contract. And again, you don't get to adjust it daily. It's, it's more fixed. So if you're trying to capture everyday uh, experience of consumers, that's not really part of it. That's in the background. That's not what they're, they're seeing and basing expectations on. CPI is also usually presented after seasonal adjustment because they want to highlight price changes that are beyond the ordinary seasonal fluctuations. And there's a reason for doing that. You don't want to be seeing prices run up or down seasonally and, and think that that represents a, a new trend in pricing. But by the same token, I don't get to go to the cash register and pay this seasonally adjusted price. I pay whatever the current price is. So for their purposes, this makes sense. But you have to think about what it means in terms of, of what a, a consumer's experience is. So what's wrong? As with most things, the strengths are also the weaknesses. People don't pay quality adjusted prices. People don't pay seasonally adjusted prices. People don't frequently buy durable goods or renegotiate their mortgage. Uh, normal folks live in a cash world where they buy what's available at current prices. There's this, this whole bundling issue is, is uh, is a, is a problem with the, the CPI. And so it, it really doesn't capture consumers' day-to-day -day market experience. Now, we, uh, we stepped into this thing and we were getting, uh, part of our motivation uh, is that we had people, we talked to people. Uh, we have readers and members and they talked to us and they were telling us that their experience with prices uh, was not accurately reflected in the CPI, the official government numbers. They said, boy, when I go out there day to day and buy gas and go to the grocery store and do the things that I do, it sure feels like inflation is a lot more than what they say. Now, we could just say they're wrong, and sometimes people are just wrong, but often they're right. I mean, there, there's some validity to their experience. And so part of our study was to determine whether or not uh, we could validate their experience. Did it make sense? And in fact, if it does make sense, then it would, re it would help us to understand about how they're forming expectations, how they're, they're suffering budget risks and other things. So we wanted to see, is there any truth to this thing? So we built an everyday price index. Uh, it's not a measure of broad-based price inflation like the CPI. Uh, it does not measure how the average of all prices change. It's a more select group. It's the things that people buy day to day. It reflects the day to day experience, the everyday experience of people as they, they buy the things that they experience day to day. And therefore, it, it, it measures the impact on their budgets. If you go to the grocery store thinking it's going to cost $50 to buy your week's groceries and you walk away and have spent $75, uh, that is an important event to you and you remember that. Uh, EPI is not a better measure of inflation than the CPI. From what I've said, you may even wonder whether CPI really is a measure of inflation, you know. Uh, but EPI and CPI do not measure the same thing. I want to make that clear. Uh, people have tried to interpret our EPI as a broad-based inflation index. It's not that. It's more about day-to-day -day experience. So we're looking at the variability of everyday prices, pricing risk. So our motivations were that personal experiences seem to be inconsistent with the CPI. Uh, sticker shock may represent a kind of an inflation risk. Uh, the, uh, there are implications for consumer behavior when they have unexpected price increases in their day-to-day -day prices, and it also affects the way that they form inflationary expectations. Mr. Bernanke has been working very hard over the last few years 
to shape consumer expectations about prices. He's always jawboning. And he's even been obvious about it. He even talks about their information programs, how they're trying to affect expectations. Because Fed policy is affected by, the effectiveness of Fed policy is affected by people's expectations. And so he, he's trying to shape expectations in order to achieve his policy goals. And we're saying that people's inflationary expectations are maybe more set by their day-to-day -day price experience than by the broad-based inflationary uh, experience. What is what? The sticker shock. Sticker shock. Uh, it's when you, you, you expected, uh, let's say, uh, buy a refrigerator, you thought it was only going to be $800, and you walk in the store and, oh my gosh, it's $1,000. So there's a surprise. You were expecting a different kind of pricing, and you, you, you saw something that, that, that surprised you, and therefore it had an impact on your, your, your budgeting. You had budgeted uh, otherwise, and now you're surprised to see uh, a different kind of pricing. So there are also implications for investment strategy and other financial decisions. So how do we construct this thing? We, we went to the BLS survey. We, we respect what they do. Uh, they had gone to all the trouble to collect all the raw data. Why would I go out and collect it again? There's no advantage to that. They do a, a very good job. We went back to their, their, uh, their survey and we said, well, how much of these things are individuals buying? Uh, so we're going to select the goods that we think they buy day to day and we'll use the weights because that tells us uh, the actual volume of those things they buy. We can use the BLS raw series. We also set up dynamic weights to adjust annually the price responses between re rebasing. So they rebase every other year and we want to make adjustments uh, at least annually to accommodate substitution effects and other kinds of things. So it turns out that that uh, total everyday expenditure is roughly 40% of total expenditure. And uh, this includes the prices of about 30,000 goods and services. This is the kind of things you see and experience day to day. So we, we, we have narrowed the, the, the goods to goods and services to things that you buy on a regular basis. We do not seasonally adjust. We don't eliminate seasonal adjustment to mislead. I want to make it clear. I've had some people actually question me about that. Well, that's a one-month change, and that, that's not seasonally adjusted, so that could mean this or that. I understand that. I'm an economist. I've even, for the fun of it, I've seasonally adjusted the series just to see what it does, because I'm an economist, and we like those things. I'm, I'm sorry. But, but, but we also want this thing to reflect what you had to pay out that month, and you don't get to pay seasonally adjusted prices at the register. So, so we've, we, we've stuck to not seasonally adjusted because of what we're trying to measure. Whoops, what happened there? Huh. There we go. Now, so to select, we, we took products or services that the typical consumer would might purchase within a month. So prominent were things like food, beverages, household expenses, all kinds of energy products, transportation, recreational expenses, prescription drugs, a lot of non-durable consumer goods and services. Uh, it, it excludes the durable goods for the most part, uh, housing and infrequent purchases, so it's leaving out uh, refrigerators and televisions and things like that. We even looked at some, uh, we looked, if you look at the, the, um, the weights on things like a men's suit, people don't buy a men's suit every, every month. So we were even going to that level trying to figure out what, what they buy. It also, because of removing the durable goods and some kinds of long-term expenditures, like in electronics and things, it eliminates uh, most of the quality adjustments. It's a little hard to do the quality adjustments uh, directly because they do that at the individual item level uh, right after collection. So it's a little hard to, to do it directly, but we know which ones they're flagged, which ones are quality adjusted, and we've eliminated most of them. So we feel like we're getting a much better read on, on what the actual prices are. So we think that less than 20% of the EPI components are potentially subject to quality adjustment. We think we've removed most of the big ones. This shows uh, annual increases in the EPI components uh, for last year. Uh, you can see the, the, these are broad categories. Uh, the lists are very long. But you can see that there's a quite a bit of variation across different kinds of goods and what the, what the prices are, what the price changes are. The overall index last year was 2.54%. 
food and beverages were about the same. Household fuel and utility supplies went down. We know in the second half of the year we had some benefit from falling oil prices. Um, we see uh, motor fuel and transportation going up uh, overall for the year. Uh, prescription drugs are up and, and so on. So we have a, uh, some variation across the different components. Out of pocket. pocket, out of pocket, yeah. So the findings were is that we actually can validate the public's notion that the prices they experience day to day are substantially higher. For example, the first year we did this, uh, 2011, according to the CPI, the average annual inflation rate was 3.1 percent, the EPI was 8 percent. So it, it, it can be quite a bit different. Uh, the CPI and the EPI price indexes, not the changes, but the price indexes, tracked very closely until uh, around the early years of the last decade. After uh, 2002, we saw them start to diverge with the EPI outpacing the CPI. We think this is due to oil and energy cost. There was also the introduction of a lot of high technology products which would have been quality adjusted downward in the CPI, so the actual out-of-pocket prices uh, were much higher but they were quality adjusted downward. Um, and of course the increase in globalization and reduction of trade restrictions drove down prices of many goods. Uh, we've seen in recent, uh, well in the last, uh, last uh, year and a half, we, we've seen declines in import prices, for example. Uh, so uh, this, this puts a lot of pressure on, um, on domestic producers. They can't raise prices when the imports are coming in cheap, you know. This shows the uh, EPI and CPI in levels and you can see that they track closely as I just said until about 2002 and after that the EPI really takes off uh, compared to the CPI. Um, and again that's these factors that I just described, technology, oil, uh, energy costs, that sort of thing. So there's been quite a difference. So this is sort of curious that before 2002 th there wouldn't have been as much perception in the public of everyday prices that they experience being different. And in fact, there was not. This is a relatively new phenomenon. They're saying, it just doesn't feel like that. I swear, inflation's higher than what they're telling me. They're lying to me, you know, whatever. But uh, there's a reason why this is a relatively new phenomenon. And we can see it in the data. You can also already tell that the EPI is quite a bit more volatile. Uh, prices do swing a lot more than, than we, we realize. Um, I have somewhere here. Oh, I know where I did it. Okay. If we want to look at the current inflation environment, latest uh, data, CPI fell four tenths of a percent in April after falling two tenths of a percent in March. Now, this is seasonally adjusted. If you remove the seasonal adjustment, then CPI fell 0.1 percent in April, which is quite a bit less. Now, the big driver here was was gasoline. Um, seasonally adjusted, the CPI gas index fell by 8.1 percent in April. It's, it's quite a change. Uh, this has been a big boon to the economy. When oil and, and uh, gasoline prices fall, it, uh, it, it certainly uh, uh, brings down all the indexes. Uh, it has another effect that, that people view these products as necessities and so they, they uh, their, their other expenditures, their other consumer expenditures are after they paid for their gas and oil. I'm, I'm simplifying it a bit, but that's sort of what happens. So, so we're going into 2013 with higher taxes, but they're having lower uh, gasoline prices recently, as you, you've seen, which means that people have more money left over after they bought their gasoline to buy goods. So it helps to offset the higher taxes to have a lower uh, basic good like this, uh, a lower price basic good like this. Yeah. Do you adjust it all for the improving mileage of the auto fleet? We, we are looking at just whatever they buy. But the, the, there's a weight on gas, right? There's a weight on gas and... I and that uh, clearly the, price, the prices are more they, volatile than would be corrected for with the... They, they every, every, uh, every year that it's rebased, you adjust for the the uh, the changing uh, how much of the gasoline they actually buy, so yeah, you you do you have to accommodate that. Yeah. <coughs> the price of gas affects every consumer good, you know. That's right. <laughs> like even golf balls and 
the capsules, that, the coatings that go on prescription drugs. So why wouldn't that affect the entire index? It, it does. It, it absolutely, it's, it's, it's well, well said. Uh, the, yeah, the, it does. What happens is uh, a lot of products, uh, synthetics, uh, plastics, uh, uh, you know, textile type materials that are synthetic, uh, uh, I mean, it's pervasive. Uh, but what you see is you'll see it initially appear in, in oil prices, and then you'll see it move out to gasoline and then into other, other kinds of goods. And so it's uh, this lowering of gasoline prices, oil prices, especially early this year, have had a huge dampening effect. But it's taken a while to move through, move through the economy. It's got a, it's got a. So it's sort of a lagging effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see it move into the other goods with a lagging effect. Um, but then the question is, how how long is it going to last? Because it is a, a volatile uh, commodity. Uh, there are some theories that, uh, uh, in fact. Uh, Gasoline and oil are pretty plentiful now, and so uh, uh, we, we may not see big big spikes in, in gas and oil in the near future. But uh, probably the big declines are are over for a while. Um, but yeah, it, it does move out into other goods. So we we've actually been writing about this as being a kind of oil serendipity that that you know you have this effect of of it driving down the prices of goods, and of course even you, you have as I said through transportation, but then transportation costs reduce the price of delivered goods and then in the actual manufacture of the goods it starts to move down through the economy. Uh, the other thing that happens though is you have this demand effect where now people have more buying power after they, they buy their oil products or other goods and so that stimulates demand which, which starts to move prices the other direction. So you, you've got a lot going on here. We do see that gas prices have ended their fall. We've seen, uh, they seem to have bottomed out and they're starting to rise again. And currently the national price for regular gas is about 360 a gallon. It was closer to 350 uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It seems to have started to turn back up. We know that uh, producers are trying to manage their production to keep the prices at a reasonable level. We had an interesting situation in the fourth quarter where they got ahead of themselves and they overproduced. And at one point in the fourth quarter, a barrel of gasoline uh, actually cost less than a barrel of oil, which, which meant it was a losing proposition to refine oil. Uh, and of course, the producers didn't take them long to figure this out. They said, well, this will be a good time to, to do our maintenance. <laughs> and they started shutting down refineries and doing other things. And then, of course, we saw gas prices spike going into the first quarter as they, as they finished this process and changed to the new summer blends. But now they're back online, everything's settled back out, and we're kind of back on trend again. But um, we, we've seen some, some odd swings in, in, in oil uh, and gasoline. The index for all items, less food and energy, rose a tenth of a percent in April, and that's the, what's left after you take those out. And uh, it's probably one of the reasons why it is as modest as it is, is because of what you just said, is that you're starting to see that effect of the, the lower oil prices moving out into these other goods. So in terms of everyday prices, the EPI fell uh, eight-tenths of a percent in April after rising three-tenths of a percent in March. So it's a little more volatile, bigger swing. We did see the decline because of the, the oil prices, uh, oil and gasoline prices. So it was driven primarily by motor fuel and transportation. So on an unadjusted basis, um, prices in this category, uh, you know, fuel and transportation, they make up 20.5% of the EPI, and they fell 2.9% in April. So that's a huge one month drop. Yeah? You, you might be getting this, but I just wonder if you could talk a little more about what, in what context it would be more sort of valid or viable to use the EPI versus sort of the CPI or, or, or the PC. Like, when would you suggest sort of. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, it, it, it is a way to capture people's uh, experience what their perceptions are, how they're forming expectations, um, their reactions to, to policy even. Uh, this is what they see, what they feel. Um, and, it, and if they're investing and, and they, they see, uh, like in, in 2011, that uh, they can make a, a half percent on their bank account and they're, they're seeing, they perceive prices going up by 8% in the year, uh, that's going to have a different impact on their, their investment decisions than uh, if the, the inflation were more modest. So it may drive them towards more risk and other things. So in, in investment context, in household context, household budgeting context, 
uh, expectation formation context. I mean, there's lots of places that you would want to know what, what the people act out there actually think is going on. It also reflects the fact that, that while in some theoretical sense the, the broad-based inflation is more tame, that, uh, that, that really doesn't reflect uh, uh, the total inflation experience. Inflation is about how far your, your dollars go, right? Uh, and and if, uh, if, you're, if your everyday prices, which is where you spend most of your money, if you're seeing a very high inflation rate, uh, then that means your, your dollars aren't going as far. Uh, uh, and people, not everybody, when you, when you take a basket of goods like the, uh, the CPI, uh, not everybody is buying all those goods. I mean, everybody has their own private price index, their own private basket of goods that they buy. And what we're saying is that a lot of people who are lower income, for example, may be buying less in the way of durable goods and they're living more day to day. And that means they're facing a, a lot greater burden of inflation in their, in their lives. So you have to think about this in a, in a broader way. Uh, cost of communication services was the second largest uh, area in which we saw price drops. This shows the EPI and the CPI. The CPI is the line, the EPI is the bars. I'm colorblind, so by making different graphs, I can tell them apart, see? Uh, anyway, uh, you can see that the CPI is much more tame, much less volatile, uh, the numbers have been lower, and in fact, the EPI is a much bigger swinger. Um, and again, it's not seasonally adjusted as well. So your people are experiencing a lot of volatility in the prices they see, and they're seeing a lot more inflation than is being revealed by the, by the CPI. Um, if we look at uh, other signs of inflation, because we have to look behind oil, and it's hard because, as you said, oil is pervasive. What else do we see that says that people are forming expectations for higher inflation? This shows the, the spreads between the inflation indexed uh, 10 year treasuries and the, the non indexed treasuries. And what we can see is there's a, there's a broad secular trend coming up from 2009, moving upward. And in fact, since uh, mid uh, 2011, we see, a, uh, we see it trending upward. And we were up towards 2.5%, and now it's dropped back just a little bit. But this means that people's inflationary expectations have been rising. And these are mostly knowledgeable investors who have some reason to, to form at least reasonable expectations. Yeah? What does that say about the efforts to sort of manage the inflation expectations that you were talking about this year, the efforts by the Fed? Does that mean that that strategy essentially doesn't work? Or? No, I, I, think, I think the Fed has done a pretty good job of keeping a lid on things. But uh, uh, little by little, th this is not skyrocketing. You know, we're not at 10%, and I know you know that, but I mean, it's not like it's skyrocketing or anything. We're not, we're not looking for hyperinflation on the horizon or anything like that, but you can see it creeping up. And you, you also, we've watched month to month, and we've seen, for example, long bond yields will pop one month, and then you'll see the Fed sp spike the money supply, and it'll drop back into line. And they're, they're trying to manage that, that the yield curve and, and manage those, those rates, and it's getting increasingly difficult. They're having to fight it. And that's simply because people, you know, they catch on. They eventually catch on. And uh, I, th I think that their inflationary expectations aren't huge, but this shows that they are rising. They, they see it. This is an interesting thing that we noticed, uh, M2 money supply. The Fed has gone to, to extraordinary ends to keep this trend upward, the, the, where the, the, the blue dashed line is, uh, it's trending upward. And they uh, increased bank reserves by just phenomenal amounts in efforts to keep that going. Uh, and they rightfully were concerned that, that if credit didn't move freely, if there was an interruption, that there could be a, a worse financial crisis and, and a return to recession. So they were doing whatever it took to keep that thing moving. Uh, and people were starting to feel pretty good about the economy and, and thinking we, we may have the worst behind us and all that sort of thing. And then right at the beginning of the year, M2 just, just took a nosedive. Uh, it, it, it uh, at the very least went flat. I would say it went down. If you look at the numbers, it actually did go down quite a bit. And uh, this, this was a, a big concern. Uh, if that kept going that way, there would be a tighter credit and you could expect uh, 
a lack of liquidity in the system, you expect the economy to slow and so on. This, this, is, a, this is a scary little event. So I'm, so I'm saying I certainly understand the, the Fed's concern. We're not, we're not here to pick on people, we're just trying to see what they're doing. <laughs> What's going on here, right? Uh, and so what we, we saw is that in fact bank credit went flat. That's what happened. And so you've got bank reserves, banks take the reserves, they make loans. When they make loans, they, they, people, they give money to people who then take it out and spend it and somebody else puts it in their bank who then makes a loan and then it gets, and it, it gets multiplied. It gets expanded from base money uh, into, into uh, the money supply, into M2, for example. And so when the, bank, uh, the banks uh, flattened out, they stopped lending, basically. Uh, that money isn't moving out of reserves and into the system, and the money supply is not being expanded. So you've got this gap, and this is the old pushing on a string. The Fed's putting money in bank reserves, but unless the, the banks make the loans and borrowers want to borrow, uh, you don't move the money out. And this thing just went flat. Now this is obviously both on the bank side, although if you look at the bank uh, provisions, interest rates, uh, uh, requirements, uh, th 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 there's nothing changed. If anything, they're loosening uh, their terms. Uh, so it's probably on the demand side as well, or primarily the demand side, that people aren't making the, the loans. So the money's not moving out, so the money supply is going flat. So here's the Fed's solution which when I saw this went, oh my gosh, you know, and for a monetary economist, you sort of clutch your chest and go, are you kidding me? Uh, but, but in fairness, you kind of know where that comes from. They're trying to get that M2 back up where it was, and so they just, all they can do is push up uh, reserves. They just pour more money into the banks, open the spigots, get some money out there, and hope that some of it flows through into the marketplace. But, I mean, they were already running at about 15 times required reserves. Banks normally run about 1 to 2 percent over their required reserves, and we're, we were like 15 times. Okay, this is getting extreme, and then we do this. Oh yeah, good plan. And people are worried that these huge reserves, when they finally do move out of the system, they'll be inflationary. If the lending really takes off, it'll push that money out into M2, and the Fed won't be able to pull it back fast enough to, to control this. Now, we were just at uh, a meeting uh, with Pollard, who's the head of the SOMA, the, the, the system open market account uh, at the Fed, and he was talking about how he's gonna drain off these reserves, and there's been a lot in the press about you know, how they're gonna, they're gonna do their exit strategy. Uh, but there, there, is a, there are some things they can do. They pay interest on reserves now, which could help to contain those reserves. But if they do that, then they have to pay the bill. I mean, as interest rates rise, as the economy recovers, uh, which presumably is what's going to, to drive the expansion of money, then, then the Fed is going to have to raise the interest rates on reserves, and they're going to have an increasing bill. And so instead of turning over $80 billion to Congress at the end of the year, they're going to be coming in and asking for money. Or they're going to be printing their own, which is going to be inflationary as well. I mean, they're going to get into a trap. A lot of concern about how this is going to play out. They could increase reserve requirements. There's all sorts of things they can do, but this only makes the problem worse, is the point. That problem worse. It may solve the other problem of lack of liquidity causing another recession. And I, and I said, I, boy, I get it. <laughs> I don't want another recession. But it also raises the other problem about, about inflation. And so then what you saw, I'm trying to get this thing to go back now. There we go is you saw after the end of the red line there, you can see that it started to pop back up again. They finally poured enough money into the system to get it to start to move back again. Uh, but there was a little scary little episode here which uh, reflected uh, some problems going into the new year and uh, again reflects, they got this back on track, but the increase in reserves reflect uh, an inflationary risk for the future. So as we assess Inflationary risk, we recognize that as one of many issues. Again, no one of these things points to, none of them point to hyperinflation, but some of these point that there's some inflationary pressure uh, building. We look at the trade weighted dollar and we can see that it's been rising, the major index dollar, which means that it's cheaper for Americans to buy foreign goods, which uh, given the weakness in the world economy, uh, foreign uh, producers are reluctant to raise prices anyway. 
and then we our dollar goes farther in terms of buying the foreign goods, which also means cheap goods flowing in from elsewhere, which makes it harder for domestic producers to raise their prices when cheaper and cheaper goods are coming in from other places. So there's a there's kind of a lid being held down on, on the price increases by the fact of the foreign uh, imports coming in at low prices. So that that's helping to, that's why we see money growing, we see other things happening, you say where's the inflation, but it turns out that in fact there's other pressures that are helping to keep it contained. Oil is driving everything down, it's burying, hiding uh, what inflation there is. You have uh, foreign goods coming in at low prices, you have other things that are helping to keep things under control. Another thing here is velocity. The Fed is trying to stimulate the economy and uh, the only th what makes inflation is dollar circulating. You know, just having money sitting in a bank somewhere doesn't cause inflation. You actually have to have that money move out into the economy and get spent. It has to change hands. And when you have increasing numbers of dollars changing hands, that's when you get the inflationary pressure. Uh, so that, that, that frequency with which the dollars change hands, that's velocity. And what we're seeing is velocity is coming down, down, down. Now, it always comes down in recessions, as you can see. The, the gray bars are the recessions. And then it levels out at a new level as, as the money is then absorbed into the economy and circulates. Uh, but what we've seen recently is, uh, since uh, early 2011, is that velocity is continuing to, to drop even though we're not in a recession. So it, dollars are changing hands ever more slowly. So in that environment, it's hard to create inflation uh, from, from money. Uh, again, if the economy starts to take off and we start to see money changing hands more rapidly, uh, the loans start to occur, uh, the foreign economies start to firm up and they start raising prices and uh, uh, we see shifts in, in uh, exchange rates. All of this will contribute to a, a rising price scenario. Um, but right now this is helping to, to contain the inflationary pressure. So what's coming? Well, at the finished goods level, wholesale energy prices fell 2.5% in April and 2.4% in March. Uh, so we, we still have, uh, at the finished goods level, uh, energy prices uh, uh, falling. But there are some signs that the oil prices are stabilizing. Uh, I mentioned uh, there are these aberrant swings in oil and gasoline prices in the first quarter and then falling into the, in the fourth quarter and the first quarter. So we've now stabilized and we're back on trend. Um, gasoline prices have firmed at the pump. We saw PPI crude goods uh, energy index, that's the raw oil and, and, and uh, early, um, early oil products, uh, rose 3.7% in April, and the crude oil prices have firmed. So all this says that oil is starting to, to firm up and even rise at the crude materials level. And what we would see is that the, at the crude level, they start to rise, and then they move through the stages of production. So at the intermediate and the final goods uh, levels, you'll see the prices start to come up. Gasoline prices will firm up even more as they move through the stages of production. So you get it out of the ground, you send it to the refinery, and you know it's got to make its way up through the system. So we're seeing at the lowest system, the earliest point, that the prices are starting to rise. So we would assume that's going to move up through the system. Uh, import prices. Uh, we're down uh, half a percent and export prices were down 0.7 percent. That reflects the, the weak world economy. As the world economy starts to recover, we would expect to see that turn. But right now, uh, it is a benefit in keeping these prices under control. We also have to note that monetary policy is very accommodative. And uh, the Fed's, uh, but the Fed is talking about an exit strategy. And I think whatever they do will be gradual. So I don't think we're going to see a dramatic shift in Fed policy. And as we saw in January, February this year, uh, if there's any, any burp or flinch in the system, they're going to pour money at it. That's what they're going to do. That's, that's what they do. That's the only tool that they have. So uh, it's a mixed bag. We think that prices will firm up a little bit. We're not looking for runaway inflation at this juncture, but we're, we're looking for some firming of prices as the economies around the world recover and uh, the oil prices come back in, into line. And uh, we also had some some food price uh, shifts that occurred following last year's drought 
and those are, we're working through those in the first half. So that, that'll be pretty flat going in the second half of the year. So we're seeing uh, all of this sort of level out into a normal price trend and recovery. So we probably are expecting a little bit higher inflation by the end of the year, but, but not anything uh, that's uh, going to be terribly scary. So that's, that's our inflation outlook in a, in a nutshell. Um, I hope that, uh, I know it's a little tedious, but going through some of these inflation measures, I hope they're helpful because I think they are, they are not used correctly. And when I get calls from the media, often that's where it winds up starting because they're trying to figure out why this is going up and that's not or whatever. And uh, it really helps to understand what these people are trying to measure. Yeah. Which, which of the measures do you think is um, the most clear? What kind of changes do you need to make for this to think about long term social security? <clears throat> well, uh, it's, it seems logical to go to a CPIE kind of thing and look at the CPI for the elderly. I don't think the W makes any sense. I, I don't think it does. Um, I think that they need to look at this without the quality adjustments. I, I think that's, that's misleading. I think, I think it is. Um, there are some other work they need to do to work on those indexes to better handle how medical uh, care is handled in it uh, and, and even prescription drugs. There's some, there's some problems the way they're handling that. The trouble is it's a lot of choices. You have to go through and, and make decisions and you need to probably build an index that, that you, you sp like a CPIE, CPI for the elderly, that that is designed to, to deal with the specific problems of the elderly and the cost they face. And they just haven't done it that way. They, I don't then think. Then it would it mean much higher cost, right? It's going to mean higher cost, yeah. No question about it. The substitution thing is hard to deal with. That, that's, in a sense, if, 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 I, uh, if I'm used to buying a certain kind of good, or this is the one that has always served my purposes, and you, you essentially force me to buy another good because of the the rising price of that good, uh, that's, that's a kind of a cost too. I mean, um, it, it's tempting to just say, well, let them substitute. Um, in some cases, that's all right. But um, so, so actually accounting for substitution is, is very difficult. They, they also have issues with um, how they handle some of the discounting procedures that, that are used by, by stores. I mean, I, when I was at the Fed, I went out to lunch one day and um, I'm going to date myself, but I, I, they were selling discs, floppy discs, you know, and I bought a box of floppy discs and taped to the side of the box of 10 was two extra discs. So it's the same price, but now two extra discs, you know. And I had that and I had a Hershey's bar that said now 20% more chocolate or whatever. And I actually threw them down on the desk and I wanted to know if they were accounting for this in the price index. I'll ask all the dumb questions. You, how else are you going to find out, right? So I, I went in, uh, we were over at BLS and Treasury, and we, everybody kind of roams, you know. So I threw it down on the, on the desk and I asked, and then we actually went through it and how they, they take it down to per disc price and per ounce price and bars and all that stuff. In some cases, you can do that easily. In others, it's not so easy, especially if you have drugs that you took three a day before, and now you take one a day, but then they have a different effect, and they do this and that. And, and so when you get into to, to drugs and other things, sometimes it's harder to figure out how to make adjustments to have continuity in the series. And they have new products that get introduced, and they don't have, they wasn't in the series before, and so how do you incorporate it? I have a question. Yeah. That's a super question. Um, when you are talking about how to measure inflation, which is the better measure, um, we are talking about all different kinds of C C CPI or PCE. Have you ever considered like GDP deflator? Because CPI is based on a basket of goods, products, but CPI, GDP deflator, it measures all of kind of goods because it's based on GDP. So have we have <coughs> you ever considered GDP deflator or have you had some comments? On yeah, that? sure. The GDP deflator is obviously the, the broadest index. It includes everything that gets bought and sold in, in the economy over the course of a, of a year. The, uh, the problem with the, with the deflator and the reason it's not used is that, you know, I don't buy a tractor every year. I've never bought a jet aircraft. I never bought a tractor either. Okay, let's be honest. But, but I mean, it includes everything that gets bought and sold. Now, if you're looking at, a, at, a, at a, an index that like the Fed might want to use for policy, then maybe they should be using the GDP deflator because that's what they're looking at. They want to see, broad-based uh, movement in prices. So that might make more sense for them. But as a consumer index, um, 
it, it's misleading because it has all the business expenditure in there and uh, capital expenditure, all that that you don't ever see or deal with, you know. Uh, but what, what we do as economists, as John knows, is we, we wind up looking at all of these and we know what each one measures and then we sort of build a picture. Well, this is going up, this is going down, but this includes this, this includes that, and we sort of build a picture out of that to get what's going on. We look at all the sub-indexes too. So each one of these has sub-indexes of, uh, of uh, food and energy and uh, uh, recreational goods and communication goods and whatever else. And we're looking at all the different pieces and seeing how they're moving and trying to get a picture of what's driving what. Uh, but that, it's not, that's not something that the average consumer can, can make sense of, I'm afraid. So that's why they try to find the one index that does the job. Yeah. You mentioned inflation targeting earlier. Do you think it makes sense for the U.S. to look at sort of a harder line like other countries are doing? Yeah, uh, I do. I do. I think uh, you know Bernanke was a big inflation targeting guy before he got in into office, and and then all of a sudden he you know he, he I guess he took his job seriously that he's got this mandate that he has to do certain things. You know, I mean, I I, I get it. You know, but. Um, it, that's been what's happened around the world is that many countries have gone to inflation targeting because it's they realize there's just not that much they can do in terms of of uh, you know activist policy and in, in affecting the real sector the the transmission mechanisms have changed it's not as easy to actually affect the real sector like it once was uh, the lags are different um, I mean look at what Bernanke's been going through the problem is politically, even though he's not supposed to be a political creature, Bernanke is in a world where if the economy is collapsing and, he, and it appears he's not doing anything, you know, how, do you, how do you sell that? You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to make that statement. I have some things that might work. They said, well, geez, you know, we got almost 10% of the population out of work. Try something. You know, it's worth it. You know, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, I was at a, at a meeting and uh, Plosser was there, and you know, I think it was Plosser, and somebody asked him about about um, the uh, bailing out the banks, you know, and, and wasn't that really a stupid thing to do or whatever. And he said, you know, if you'd asked me a week before, he was being very honest, which I appreciate. He said, if you asked me a week before we made the decision, I said, no, there's no way we'd do that. That's crazy, you know. But he said, if you were in that room on that Thursday afternoon and they're telling you that the people are carrying boxes out of Lehman Brothers and we've got more banks that are about to go down and this could be the biggest financial catastrophe, you know, in history, uh, and I could do something about it? He said, every one of you would have said yes. You know, that's, that's the reality of the situation. I mean, no, we didn't like it. No, we didn't think it was a great thing. But, but the reality was, you know, I have the means, and how could I stand by and let that happen when I can do something about it? I think I'll figure out the consequences later, you know. And, and the Fed is put in that position a lot. Of course, adopting this, uh, this approach of just inflation targeting pulls you back out of that. And if you make that clear, it's a stated target, you get Congress to buy into it, everybody's on board, then, then you, don't, you don't even live in that world. But then Congress can't expect you to finance their deficits for them. And that, that may be the tougher sell. I mean, Bernanke's forced to produce uh, money at, a, at a, an alarming rate just to finance the deficits, and when in fact Congress should be doing something about that. Uh, maybe they are, if you depends on which, how you, you view the sequester. But the point of it being, though, is that uh, uh, as long as we run the deficits, the Fed has the choice of either letting interest rates spike and possibly derail the recovery, or print some money and face possible inflation. And so they dance, you know. Yeah. Anything else? I don't even know what time it is. It's 10 after 12?